Hashtag. Hashtag 702 Summer. That's definitely a hashtag to keep in mind. But for those of you on social media that want to get a hold of me, hashtag weekend breakfast. That's all that you look for either on Twitter or, or, or Facebook. And, uh, yeah, keep those WhatsApps coming through on 0727021702. And if you want to, give us a call on 011 Want to hear from you there as well. Good morning to you, Karen. And, uh, thanks for chatting to me this morning. I, I, I just hope that my pronunciation is correct. It is Artily Gallery, right? Yes, that's correct. Morning, Gushwell. Thank you for having me on the show today. It's an honor to be here. Only only a pleasure, Karen. Karen, let's start off with, you know, and, and let's be quite frank and honest. Not everyone goes to exhibitions on a regular basis, right? For yes. a lot of us, um, our interaction with art exhibitions is what we see in a fall. Right in the movie, um, people walking around right. drinking some wine, looking at art, trying to interpret it. Someone talking to the artist, and then occasionally mm-hmm. someone that is, uh, you know, has deep pockets is able to to buy themselves a piece of art there and then. I mean, is that ultimately the the definition and the understanding, the correct definition and understanding of an exhibition? Uh, no, definitely not. I think um, actually, you know, just having worked in a gallery and having been an artist myself, mm. that you definitely see that the that you have different kind of responses from the public to a gallery and to an exhibition. A large portion of the public I feel a little bit intimidated by a gallery because there's often a great deal of mystery around the title of an artwork, what is an artist trying to say, And indeed, what is the intention of an art gallery? You know, is it a cultural place? Is it an educational space? Is it a commercial space? And Mm. the gallery falls in multiple roles. But I think a large portion of the public, it's a bit of a unsure, like what what the space is about. So what we try to do as a gallery is put together exhibitions um, where the storytelling um, is quite strong and relevant. And on an ongoing basis, do quite a lot of uh, social media marketing, you know, working with platforms like Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, to present that exhibition opportunity to as many people as possible and to draw people in. And on those platforms of marketing, say as much as we can, you know, without Mm. being too much information about the artwork, about the artist, so people start engaging. And even if they are on the outside, you know, of the kind of person that might enter gallery, they start engaging from that perspective. And I think that gives them confidence then to join in and come to an exhibition and, you know, come and visit the gallery and view the work and enjoy it. In terms of um, galleries and art exhibitions, I mean, where do we stand today? Because even prior to... Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which obviously has led to a lot of difficulty, especially in the art space, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, I guess it's easy for us to turn to 2020 and to say that, look, because of the pandemic, we've seen massive changes and there's been a decline in this space and that space. Uh, but mm-hmm. as I said, you know, a good fri- a friend of mine had a, a gallery for, for many years and way before we even thought of COVID-19 ever being a thing, um, yes. They were they were forced to shut down because after a while, you know, yes. uh, fewer and fewer uh, people were coming through. I mean, what is the status now at this stage? And do we see an uptick? Do we see, uh, you, you know, the space actually being under threat? Um, well, I think COVID-19 um, obviously brought everything forward, uh, they say, roughly about 10 years. Mm. And I think when we started uh, researching our gallery model, which was in 2018, we realized the future of marketing and exposure for galleries was going to be online. And so at that point, we already started developing our gallery so that it would be online. Um, And in fact, we opened three days before lockdown, our physical space, but because we had developed the online model, it was appropriate for the moment. And we were just extremely lucky with the timing um, that it happened in, in that way, that we continued and, in fact, started the gallery online. So I think, you know, there are a lot of galleries that are hesitant online. You'll notice that some galleries on, do not put uh, pricing transparency online. 
Um, some galleries do put pricing transparency online, but they do not sell online. Mm. And other galleries will put pricing online and sell online. So every gallery has their uh, specific approach to how they want to interact with those platforms and how sure. they utilize those to maximize the opportunity. So I think now it's become the norm, you know, is that omni-channel marketing, you know, working through different channels to um, bring the artwork to the public is more normal now than it was uh, before 2020. Mm, mm. Uh, so I guess also another space that uh, for, you know, all intents and purposes, and as you had highlighted, um, I guess the pandemic did bring us 10 years forward. Um, yeah. you know, dragged us uh, 10 years forward, um, willingly or unwillingly. But the point ultimately is this, is that, you know, gone is sort of the traditional way of doing things where it is out yeah. there physically looking at uh, works of art and, and, and being yeah. able to interact um, to okay. largely people being able to obviously enjoy this and, and participate uh, in an online space. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, I see that I have a call from Paul in Malville very quickly. I just want to hear what uh, Paul's uh, input is on this conversation. Mm. Paul, good morning to you. Hi. Um, first of all, um, I participate in a lot of art exhibitions, mm. but in a way that I usually interview artists to figure out exactly what their work is about. Now, I'm the ultimate art heathen, you know. Mm. I'm kind of the, I know nothing about art, but I know what I like kind of person. But I ask questions from a layperson's perspective. Mm. And I mean, people like Walter Altman are incredibly well-versed in explaining what their works are about. Mm. Uh, Usha Sijurim as well incredibly well-versed in explaining what drives her work. And some of her works are incredibly spectacular. Mm. What I actually do find is that a lot of people, as your um, uh, guest said, Mm. are intimidated. You mustn't be intimidated. If the artist is there, go and ask them. Usually they are more than generous with their time. Indeed. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Paul. Thanks for that. Heads up. And, and I guess that is the point, isn't it? It's, it's about expression. Mm. Uh, someone is using this as a means to express themselves. Um, yeah. how better yet? I mean, and, and yes, it is obviously open to interpretation. I mean, that's something that's part and parcel of the space, right? Where I have an opportunity to sit down and to actually, um, look at it, view it, think about it, and then interpret it for myself. But how better yet than to be able to get the input of the creator themselves uh, to be able to say, but hang on, what is it that you wanted to convey with this particular piece and have a deep conversation with someone on, on, a, on their worldview even? Yes, absolutely. I mean, just, just on that prior topic of, you know, working with online platforms, because mm. today as well, artists will be putting themselves out there. They are on all of those platforms. And that, I think, gives the public a wonderful opportunity to directly engage. And I think, um, and, and that also takes away that, that kind of intimidation of a, of a gallery space. I also think artists happen to be the nicest people you can meet. They are not intimidating. Mm. They are down to earth. They are into their journey and what they're doing. And they are genuinely very hardworking people. So... They are going to be lovely to engage with and interesting. And I think, you know, an artwork can shift your worldview in like half an hour. Mm. You know, where you might read books and books and books on, uh, on a topic and still not be convinced that an artwork might do that in a very, very quick way. And I think that's part of the beauty of having a gallery space where you can put the work up and people can come and sit and just allow that piece to wash over them and allow them to to engage with it and to develop their own narrative. Because I think there's, you know, two sides to that artwork. There is what the artist is bringing forward and then there is the interpretation. So people will often, like, look at a piece of work and go, oh, you know, I just relate to that, you know, yeah. and I really, really get that. And somebody else will sit there and kind of not be sure and then that's when, you know, the opportunity to engage directly with an artist or with a gallerist to explain and inform what that work is about, sure. you know, that, that, that becomes a double-sided opportunity. But, I mean, lo- lo- looking at that, you know, the, the, the future of things, and things are changing very rapidly, and, um, you know, 
mediums are changing, you know, very quickly. And, and don't get me wrong, Karen, I'm looking at the world of art. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'm pretty much that person as well, similar to what Paul had said. I know what I like. Um, and, and I like the idea of having a painting, for example, hanging on a wall or a beautiful sculpture sitting in a, in a, in, you know, in a place of, of import in the home, you know, where people can see it yeah. and I can, uh, talk about it, et cetera, et cetera. That's for me what art means. Now we live in a new digital age where we have things like NFTs and goodness knows whatever yeah. else, right? And I know that, a lot of things are going online, but the value and, and the import of those things I don't necessarily get. Are we moving more towards a world that's, that's really digital where uh, pretty soon we're not going to see things like the physical exhibition at all? Because I, I can understand sort of a hybrid model where, um, yeah. my, you know, my art is sitting on, you know, on a website somewhere and people can interact with it there, but also at the very same time, you can actually come out and view the painting, speak to the artist, engage on that level. But it seems that we're really more and more moving towards this world that is very much digital in nature and even art or our, our interpretation and understanding of art is becoming so digital in nature that you have this phenomenon like NFTs and whatever else comes with it. Yeah, look up there, it's definitely, definitely there. And I think it's appropriate, you, you know, in a way, you can think of it like this technology, like artists who are creating, develop uh, with technology, working with a digital platform, it's a medium. It's like you work with painting, you work with sculpture, you work with ceramics, oh, and you work digitally. So it becomes another medium for an artist to work with. But I don't necessarily, from my perspective, uh, and I'm sure there are people who will disagree with me, but I don't necessarily think it's going to dominate. I think the way an artist creates, you are working with your hands. It's something that comes out of your being. And, you know, there's, I could you just think about making a painting or making a drawing. There's a certain kind of pressure you put on a pencil or paintbrush, which mm. will create a certain kind of mark. And I know digitally there are a lot of things that can imitate that, but they can never truly be that. And there's like that, that essence that comes out of an artist that is then sort of, you know, grows into that canvas as they develop a work. And that's unique to that piece. So I, for me, I see it as another, another medium mm. and another way to interact with art, but I don't think it's that dominant. Um, and I certainly, for me, I want to see artists continue to actively, physically be engaged with the work that they're making and what they're making. Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, it's, uh, you know, to that point, uh, you know, I've, uh, I'm very lucky to have many other cartoonists as, as, as part of my circle of friends. And, you know, the, the development of uh, one of the big debates and discussions is around what they call AI art, which I guess is also mm. open to interpretation where you sort of feed information into a machine and then mm. out comes art, inverted commas, on the other side. Um, it, it does raise questions around that. And I mean, a lot of that, what you have described there about um, ex human expressionism, because that's what it is ultimately, right? It's you as a human being being able to express yourself through very means, yeah. uh, various means of, of medium. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's completely being taken away. Com you know, we're being completely robbed of that opportunity through these means. And it, I'm, I'm not against the development of technology and moving ahead with technology, but I think we also need to sort of draw the line between human expressionism yeah. and, and just outright. <laughs> Uh, yeah. a, a series of zeros and ones. I am completely on the same page as you. Um, I I absolutely feel that you know you would speak to any artist. What is an intrinsic thing while they're making art? It makes them happy, you know. And it's because of that physical engagement with the piece, because they're having an opportunity to share their story or their thoughts. Mm. It's a it's a relationship and engagement an artwork has with that piece, and that's the you know, the drive for an artwork to keep create an artist to keep creating is the fact that they love it, that there's some kind of magical juice in it for them as a person. And um so that, so for me that is what's different to AI, you know. And I think there are mm. some very interesting things people are doing with AI. Um but I'm far more on the um on the side of engaging with the artwork, creating with your person, with your hands, with your body, with your mind, with your soul, with your spirit. You bring it all to that mm. piece. 
um, and that creates something beautiful. I don't want to go too meta with you on this um, issue, but but you know I I, I guess one of the things is that we be living in a world increasingly where there's sort of a, a pushback against inverted commas elitism, right? Where mm, art has mm. been seen as inaccessible and mm. it's an elite thing. Mm. It's meant for rich people that have a lot of money and uh, let's be honest also it turned into sort of a commodity to some extent where you even have mm. uh, people mm. in, in, in private banks, for example, or private bankers that are art experts now, right? So they're looking specifically mm. at art for the, uh, the purpose of investment uh, only. But uh, the point that I'm making is it, it became inex- inaccessible uh, for people. And, and I guess now the pushback is, is that while well, we're making it accessible, we, you know, mm-hmm. through, whether it be through, uh, digital NFTs or AI or whatever mm-hmm. else you may mm-hmm. think of, not suddenly inverted commas accessible. I guess that's also part of the issue. Do you think that the, that, that artists themselves, and I don't want to call it the industry because it's not, you know, <laughs> that's sort of what it's meant to be, but do you think that, artists themselves have sort of put themselves in the space or do you think that it's sort of just an invention through inexperience or lack of knowledge or lack of information? Um, I think, you know, so just to go back on one point that you made there um, mm. with um, accessibility to, to artwork, I think technology in that space really does aid accessibility and you're going to see a lot of artists um at the moment, they'll make an original piece and then they will make 10 or 12 limited edition prints of that piece, which will sell at a far reduced price. And that will give um, new collectors or new art enthusiasts who have limited budgets to buy a beautiful piece of art mm. with the story. And that ultimately makes that original piece more valuable. So... It's a very, very interesting dynamic. You know, when art becomes a commodity, I have a slight pushback against that, but it is real. It, it is there, and it's part of the, the kind of way it, it works in a business space. I mean, we, we see, for example, one of our artists, Andrew Insabele, who is, um, I've known him for many, many years, mm. He's been selling beautifully in South Africa, and then moving onto the global stage. Then your gallery, so for example, in France will say, okay, that price is too low for us. We need to increase it. And because art is a global price, your local price increases as well. And that's where we start to see um, artists work. Their prices start to increase enormously. And I think part of the, um, the skill of running a gallery maybe is to have that kind of in a sense of what, which artist is going to do that? Because then you can advise your public. This is going at a very good rate now, but down the line, you won't re- be able to purchase that at that price. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's inter- in, it, very, very interesting. But I have a slight pushback against art being a commodity because artists are people being gifted with talent, and that mm. should always be honored. It should never be taken advantage of. And I think the other thing that happens is when artwork becomes an investment mm. and resells for enormous prices, the artist is not benefiting from that. So there's a kind of a disconnect yes. yeah. um, for the artist in that space as well. I mean, a massive global debate. Um, I think, you know, around some of the Van Gogh paintings, you know, uh, didn't see a cent while he was alive and now the man is dead, mm. you know. Um, yeah. Uh, to to some extent, uh, extent long forgotten, and lo and behold, now uh, owning yeah. a Van Gogh is uh, worth uh, not a small fortune, a massive fortune actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, which is quite tragic. But I mean, taking that into account and what you had just said there, obviously people need to be able to make a living. Um, artists, in particular, yeah. those that sell their art, yeah. need to make a living. I mean, what does the landscape look like now within South Africa in particular? I mean, is it, uh, you know, uh, do we do we see improved conditions and circumstances for people or is it still pretty tough or is it getting worse? Are we seeing a decline in people yeah. pitching up at, 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 at exhibitions, buying art, uh, even engaging? I think that um, African art, contemporary African art is very much on the rise. It's a, it's um, becoming more popular globally. 
Um, mm. And I think it's also because the, the buyer has changed. So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely a change, and I see a strong um, love and passion for contemporary African art. You know, where our gallery is based, um, which is mm. in Nelson Mandela Square in Sanson, we obviously have a um, grouping of people come through that are international um, collectors and also international just fans and people coming through the space. And the love and the engagement and appreciation of the kind of artwork that is coming out of Africa right now mm. is absolutely there and it is recognized. And I think that's wonderful. I mean, I love, I love seeing it. I love seeing our this artists is... sell. I love, mm. I love knowing they're making a good living, you know. I mean, on that basis, that, that's exciting news. I, I do wonder at times, though, is it, is it something that's sustainable? And what I mean by it, is it a fad, you know, um, for lack of a better term? Uh, where there's a global interest in 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 in, in African art, uh, African expressionism, um, and that we're going to go back to people that come through and and really want to that truly appreciate it, and they're the ones that purchase the art, or is it just something that's fashionable at the moment? Because that in itself could be a bit of a threat, isn't it? Where we only we only getting it, or we only seeing an interest because of lo and behold, um, it's it's sort of the thing to own for the moment. I think. All of that is real. I, I think there are fashions. I think there mm. are trends. I mean, I think you know very often when you when when you try and identify a art movement, it's often in retrospect. You know, you see, well, there was this like like you know, currently there's been a lot of contemporary African portraiture, you know, moving moving through our galleries, moving through the artist studios and an interest and a passion in, in African portraiture. And um, that speaks to a deeper shift of identity. So I think mm. very often, you know, when you look back at something, you start to see this was not a trend. This is bigger. This is a shift in society. This is a shift in the way that we are seeing or seeing something or thinking about something. And I think, so I think there's a retrospective you know, reflective looking back at art. Mm. Um, and I think artists are often looking to the future, you know, so you have this kind of uh, tide, you know, of people looking forward and people looking backwards and the, um, the collector is somewhere in the middle of that. But um, I, I think all of that's real. I think you will definitely find work that's just fashionable and mm. then that will go out of fashion, you know. So I think if that's also something there for the... Um, for the galleries to really be looking at and to be pushing their artists a little bit, you know. Mm. So when an artist gets stuck on just reproducing something that's too similar to what they produced for the last show, you know, to get behind them and help them push a little bit further. In fact, um, our gallery has, we have a next level coach on board with us, which is Karen Basil. She's a lecturer at UJ mm. and she works with our artists to get them to push push, push to the next level, you know, to keep moving forward so that we don't get stuck into something that's just fashionable. Which is very important. Look, I mean, either way, the, the future is exciting. Um, we'll keep a close eye on it. And thanks to people like yourself, Karen, that make sure that, uh, that art remains relevant, stays up to date, but that the true essence doesn't get lost in the process. All the best to you. Oh. Wonderful. Thank you for the time. Only a pleasure. Thank you so much. That was Karen Cullinan, Director at Artley Gallery. Fascinating conversation.